Jimmy K here, Metal Voice. Look at this. The Metal Voice shirts are now on sale. Just go to the video description to find out on how you can purchase one. Metal! Welcome to the Metal Voice today on the show. Canadian legend, and I guess now UK legend, the one, the only, Mr. Jeff Waters from an island. Yeah, and, and thank you very much. It's good to be here. And you can tell I've, I'm I'm now an immigrant of another country because I even forgot you were from Canada. That's so terrible. I know, I know, I know. You know, it kind of hurt me in a way, Jeff, when you left. It, it just, damn, yeah. well, we've lost one of our own, right? You no. Know, yeah, okay, I know. But, you know, I've still got a Canadian passport. That won't change. No, no. You know, I get it. Don't worry. I understand. I mean, i do the same thing if I was you. you got to go where, you know, the the woman brings you and the opportunity takes you, right? Yes, exactly. And then there was spinoffs, bonuses that I was in the... the I was being uh, accepted as a husband to move all the way over to this country that where you go through any city here. I go through Sheffield and I think Jeff Leppard. I go through Birmingham. I yeah. think Sabbath and Priest. I go through, I'm, I'm about half an hour away from the city of Newcastle. I live in a city called Durham yeah. and Newcastle. You think Brian, Brian Johnson, the Geordie. Yes. Um, and then you got Venom and you've got uh, Raven, the Gallagher brothers, yeah. you know, so it's, yeah. it's quite a, I'm like 53 over in a new country and I'm, I'm getting to sort of all of a sudden, you know, like, you, you know, you're in Canada, the most beautiful country in the world. And it's like, I've seen it. I've been to Vancouver. I lived in Vancouver 17 years. That's my favorite city in the world and stuff. But just to be like 53 and over here, uh, scrolling, yeah. physically, scro physically scrolling. That sounds like a modern term. Physically scrolling through the UK and, yeah. and being in these places where you've got this uh, major part of the history of heavy metal and, and rock and roll coming from this place. It's like a kid in a candy store all over again here. That's good. I'm happy for you. I mean, have you adjusted now? As as every it, 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 you know, I know yeah, you have. Yeah. Everything's cool. You adjusted. You know, you're uh, you know you're driving on the right side of the street. You know, like I mean, I remember what's his name, yeah. Carl Dixon. He he had a huge accident in you know in the UK because he forgot what side of the street you got to drive on. Do you remember that from Coney yeah, Hatch? Yeah, I mean, that, that. Hey man, that was the easiest part for me. Really? Um, that was the easiest. I I thought you know at the time I was 51, I guess or whatever, and I thought. Well, I've been a Canadian uh, resident and Canadian all my life. I still am, but I, you know, living in Canada. Um, except my dad was in the uh, some special forces stuff that took him to London when I was a little kid. But other than that, I've lived in Canada my whole life. And the idea of moving anywhere was just like, why? Like, why would you ever want to leave? And especially when um, I was in Vancouver for 16 years, I had to move back to my hometown, Ottawa. But you know, Vancouver to me is paradise. And um, NBC in general, but um, yeah, I just I thought it'd be a piece of cake, fifty something years old, and you know, doing okay for myself for quite a few years, and and um, coming over here, beautiful family. Uh, I had an instant family with a couple of young kids here, uh, my wife's kids, and my son's twenty four in Ottawa. I left him behind, but we get to visit, and you know, it's he's a he's a grown man too, and my family and friends I'd leave behind, and my sort of dream house I had there. I thought. Hey man, I travel for a living. I'm in Europe half the year, always for 30 years, and this is being a piece of cake. It's going to be great, and the, 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 my my wife is so amazing, and kids, and the, the the city of Durham is actually beautiful, and uh, it was totally a shock, and I I realized I had taken on about 10 times too much, 10 times too fast. Um, it was, it, you know, and now I'm not going to be sound like what I'm going to sound like one of these spoiled babies uh but when you it doesn't matter whether things are going great or not or whether you got money or not or in the middle whatever it is if you take on too much it's bad and and i took on way too much too quickly and it, we were doing a nine-month studio build and building a loft for the band to stay in the crew when when we rehearsed because i had that in canada for for a long time and i had to have that here to keep going um I, you know, simple stuff like moving bank accounts, companies, um, your studio, your equipment, shipping it over in a freight containers. And now, oh, wow, poor musician, right? But it was kind of like you're saying goodbye to your kid. You're saying goodbye to your family and your friends, even though you can get on a plane sometimes and see them. You, you had all these things going on where you had to say bye to your dog. You had to go to another country, then the tax people on both sides hit you the immigration takes your passport you have to 
cancel your tour because you don't have a passport and that pissed off a lot of promoters and people uh, that had already pulled ads for the, and people bought tickets. And then all of a sudden the record company finds out that I can't do my record on time and they have a distributor that they have deals with and they are in trouble. And so you, you, you get all this all winding up while a nine month studio builds going on and you don't have a passport. You've just pissed everybody in your life off. Jeez, <laughs> so, geez. um, yeah. So, so for me, it was kind of like, okay, buddy, you're, you're okay. Everything's good. You're not starving. Uh, life goes on. These are small things in life. And, uh, but you know, it just, I think now that I realize it and things have calmed down since, uh, last the, the Christmas that just passed, um, I think anybody just moving to another company uh, country is uh, that must be difficult enough on its own just to sort of get used to. And there's always good things and all that, but it'd probably feel, I'm assuming a little bit bummed out if you left the beautiful country of Canada and yeah. no matter where you went to, um, let alone all the stuff I, I thought I could handle. Um, so I essentially spent a whole year of stress and feeling bummed out. And, and yet I had this beautiful family and, you know, uh, I didn't have to worry about money. I was building this beautiful studio and, you know, you know, it's going to turn out and stuff, but just getting to that finish line was like, Whoa, uh, you're mentally hanging in there, buddy. <laughs> so, I'm going to ask um, you, I, I feel you. I feel you. No, I'm going to ask you a Canadian question, but first I want to plug your new album, uh -oh. ballistic sadistic January okay. 24th, silver light, silver lining music. Excellent album. I've heard it. We yep. reviewed it in Walmart. <laughs> and uh we love the album it's a yeah. return to thrash but before i get to the album i want to ask you your take on neil pert because you know you and i were both canadian and it, it's kind of like we yeah, lost a brother I, we lost a brother and okay. what are your thoughts that you can you can imagine uh like I, I mentioned to you before we went on here um i i've been speaking to a lot of european journalists first about the new record because that's where we have our you know that 98 percent of our records and tours and everything are there so um, that question, of course, they're going to ask me that almost right away. Um, you because we're Canadian, but them because they're looking at me like I know something. Like, or, or what, what info do you have about, not about what's going on, but about like, well, that must mean something to you then, right? Because you're Canadian. Yeah. And I sort of answer that question, I answer the question like 50 times in the last three weeks, but... I, I started realizing, I think a couple of days ago, I started going, hey, just shut up about that. Every musician has said, and everybody knows, inside and outside of Canada, what Neil Peart has done as a drummer uh, to our hearts and souls, and, but, but to drummers, the influences he's, he's had on every, almost every drummer, uh, you know, since he was started. And so that part, duh, it's a given. And then, of course, Rush, everybody in the world that I know of, because, you know, you get guys like Dave Ellison messaging me and say, oh, that sucks about Neil. I, you know, like, see, I get these musicians that are sometimes messaging me that aren't from Canada sort of trying to get my take on it. And I was like, I just realized the other day that, you know what, like losing him, it's strange. It's like Canada, when you think about it, when, when I step outside and I'm living here, when some people think of Canada, they actually do think of things like maple cookies and freaking polar bears and, and ice. And they think of, you know, uh, you know what I mean? Like Leonard Cohen in the last while, you know, and, and last decade here, or two. And you've got, yeah. And, and inside Canada, that's inside, not, not outside, but you know, insiders, I was thinking inside Canada, we, we got Brian Adams. We tragically hip. Uh, of course, Brian Adams International, Tragically Hip Canadian, Rush International. E e those bands, even like Tragically Hip, for example, I was absolutely not a fan of. I never bought a record, never wanted to. I, I, I had to hear it everywhere I went, and it's completely not my style of music. But when Gord passed away, he shed a tear, and it's because Adams, Rush, Tragically Hip, a lot of these people, and more than just that, they are Canada. That is part of that damn country. It's... And I, and I started saying that in interviews that I don't even want to explain to you about this drumming stuff because everybody knows Rush's music and the trio are, are th basically all, probably the three most talented people that, in music that got together ever. Yeah. Um, and it's a drummer and all that stuff. But I basically now I'm just saying in interviews, man, they, they, these people are part of Canada. Even Brian Adams is part of Canada. Like not just as photos and uh, going to run to you. I'm talking about it's Brian Adams. You think it's Canada. It's part of my country. So, I mean, Rush, to me, is just part of Canada. It, that is Canada. It's not, they're almost not even people. <laughs> Do you know yeah, what I mean? It's a, I it's a statue. It's, a, it's a, a religion, a statue. It's a feeling. It's, 
it's something you're proud of, and it's something that's uh, even tragically hip. I myself, I just told you what I thought of the band. It's not something that I'm into, but I gotta say, when he died, it was part of Canada. Yeah, and when Neil died, not only did we lose a drummer, but we lost the lyricist. You know, one of the greatest lyricists in the world. Oh, really? Yeah, poet. We all know. See, that's the thing. We all know that. And I started thinking, screw it. I'm not saying anything else other than my favorite songs were Spirit of the Radio, Limelight has the best chorus ever, and Tom Sawyer. <laughs> Those are my top three songs. And that he was, and Rush is, and he is part of Canada. So when he died, I think a little piece of Canada died. Yeah, but I agree. It's, it's history. It's always going to be there. Yeah. Now, at least Ooh, we, ha we have his weird. music, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Rock Absolutely. and Roll Hall of Fame. I guess a lot of people ask you about that, the dissing of Judas Priest and the snubbing of not allowing Priest to sort of, you know, be inducted after two times and being the top five fan votes, along with Pat Benatar, who was number one. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I guess I, over the years, he can't help but sort of uh, having a morning coffee and you, you, you get an email in or you see something on one of the news sites or, or whatever and somebody's complaining about the... Rock and Roll Hall of Fame picks and, you know, you see certain genres of people and, oh, the complaints are always the same. Oh, that's not even rock music or even close. And, yeah, I just kind of bow out of that one because I don't even know what that has to do with anything. Do you know what I mean? Like, I am just so far, maybe it's because my band has never been a huge band, so considering being in something like that has never been an option or something I'd ever have to think about. But Didn't you guys get nominated um, for Juno? Even if I... Yeah, I mean, and to me, that was kind of like, no disrespect to Canada, but that was just like, you know, picture this, you're over here selling 3 million records, and you can't even get your hometown of Ottawa, the newspaper called the Ottawa Citizen. I couldn't even get for years and years and years, I couldn't, it was just a, a, a joke thing I would do, and they didn't realize it was, but I would, I lived very close to the Ottawa Citizen newspaper building literally three blocks away and i would go in there every time i did a cd and i'd bring a cd in and i'd write on the paper that uh, oh we're just going off on our second tour with judas priest over here in in europe and i i live three blocks away if you'd like me to come in for a quick interview or something maybe we could do a little review on the album and you know i am canadian i live around the corner um and i would get a either a form letter back or i'd get an actual email back from the editor saying hey yeah it's great that you you've done these things but do you have anything newsworthy that we can talk about <laughs> And I was like, oh, my God. Well, the Junos was just part of that thing. Either you're a Canadian band that's fully supported, and sometimes that would mean that you're only going to have some kind of chance or, even, or maybe success in Canada. Like, you know, um, is it Matthew Good? Yeah, yeah Matthew yeah. Good or Tragically Hip, Tragically Hip. Or you could do a whole list of people that are Canadians that were kind of trapped in there and wish they were, you know, doing – outside and got frustrated over their career that they couldn't get out um, or they were so damn big in the rest of the world and worked so hard like crash test dummies tra uh, or um, bare naked ladies or brian adams that they were so damn big everywhere else the canadian industry had no fucking choice other than yeah. to support them and run 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 second to the u.s to the table and pretend that they were backing them you know yeah. oh they're canadian oh they're canadian they're art um so Annihilator and the sort of heavy metal genre in general was kind of not really supported. Um, you know, there, there's lots of lots of things, but I went to the Junos because I got to put on a suit, which I hadn't done ever, I think, since a funeral or church when I was a kid. And I heard that they had, I heard they had steak, and that's my favorite food. So I went there, and I also thought it would be a, we say, I guess, a hoot, a riot, just mm -hmm. to go and. Um, and and you know what? It was absolutely hilarious. I went there, and you. It was just one of those things where I never want to be part of a scene like that, and I never have been. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. And and Go ahead. just just I've had the same sort of with the with, let's call it the local media, the the large local media. I've had the yeah. same sort of trying to get the. I'm not going to name names, and these are big radio stations yeah. that where you describe the exact same thing with the Ottawa Citizen, where they wouldn't even touch it. And they wouldn't touch these bands, and it's it's just it it just. Anyways, that's why we have shows like the Metal Voice. Screw them. Let's do what we got to do. Yeah. Ballistic, sadistic. January twenty fourth. Yeah. Civil lining music. Tell me what you did with this album that you didn't do with the last album. Yeah, I think. Well, what I did this time is I and I haven't done this for a long time, a very long decades, and that is, I went to my band that I've like 
people that don't know the history of my band, the Europeans will know it that are into metal stuff. But North Americans, since we had two or three records that were officially released here at the beginning, and the first couple were pretty big here, and then that was it. We essentially got dropped out of North America by Sony, um, and then we just kept going. It was just Japan and, and Europe just did not stop. They kept signing us, and we kept going and putting records out. So basically second album we were kind of gone from north america and then uh now 15 more outside of the country um and what i did in the early days and up until now is i essentially hired musicians and which was very strange it's like a solo project with the name of a band yeah. and behind the scenes behind the scenes and creativity creativity wise and the business side and you know who, whose band was it kind of thing it was it was obviously mine i would play the bass on all the records and guitar and, and even jump behind the drums and write the drum tracks and hire a drummer to do the drums, that kind of stuff. And, and, but the, when we toured, it was a live thing. It was an actual band. It wasn't like, Hey, it's all me and everybody else is side guys. It, when we actually played live, it was a band. So that was very confusing for North American fans. Once uh, the older fans lost track of us after the first few albums until the internet really kicked in or um, new fans that come along and go, huh? Like, what, what's up with this guy? He's got like mm -hmm. a million musicians, must be a total jerk. Um, but what I did for the first two records, and to set, um, I wrote most of, I wrote that stuff before those records came out. I'd, I'd written most of the first two albums in like 85, 86. Um, and I'd always written those, the songs for those albums with a drummer, and uh, his name was Paul Malik. I'd, most of those I'd written with a, a kid from Ottawa, and we just, I just wrote these riffs and sort of tell, told them what beats to play. And I stopped doing that after my second record. So I've done, you know, 14 records after I never wrote the same way. I would always write by myself, write guitar riffs to a drum machine, like a little drum machine. And then as computers evolved software, there was drum software where you could sort of make it sound like almost like a drummer, almost totally like a drummer. And that became a, a real easy and quick way to write. But my band turned around this time when I asked them, what do I got to do to step this up? Because this is not the beginning or middle of my career here. I, it's, it's it, you know, the clock's ticking. I'm, I'm 53, but 17 records is, you know, you're pushing your luck here. and you're, You don't want to do a long slide down. You want to just hopefully just really push and do something pretty good for this stage of the career and then get out and enjoy the rest and do something else, right? Um, so... I, I said, give me a top three list. So my three other band members, they um, they said, number one, you got to, I mean, the first list was a joke because they all got together and really uh, had a good joke on me, uh, Canadian style. The, the first thing they wanted me to do to improve the record next time, the one guy gave me a paper. His number one uh, suggestion was get Corey Taylor to sing from Slipknot. <laughs> I'm like, F you, F you. And the other one, I picked the next paper, and it was Rob Halford. And I'm like, F you. And then the, <laughs> the next one was, I, who was the last one? Uh, Stu Block from Ice Earth. There you go. So um, then we got on to the real list. And that, the, the number one thing they said was, you need to write the album with the drummer, because that's what you did in the beginning. So I said, done. Okay. I said to my drummer, do you want to write the album with me? He goes, yeah, are you kidding? <laughs> so <laughs> it was like we wrote the whole album together. Um, number two you need to use that drummer on the record, which I hadn't been doing. I'd either hire different session guys and Mike Mangini who's in Dream Theater or Randy Black who's in Destruction now. And I have I had a lot of good drummers in the band, but I've also used the drum software called uh, Superior Drummer. And it's a uh, software done by real good drummers, but it's still software. Even though it sounds like a drummer because it kind of is, it's not t totally a drummer. You're not standing there writing with this guy. Um, so uh, that was it. The second thing is I had to write... Uh, the first thing was write the album with the drummer and second was record with the drummer. So we did that. And the third thing was they said, when you two are writing this stuff, if it doesn't seem to fit on the first four albums uh, from Annihilator, then um, just chuck it out and keep going. And, and that's essentially what we did. It was never going to be, it's never going to be like the Alice and Helen, especially the Never Neverland album, which was kind of, we're known f that was our actual big album. That, that was the biggest one worldwide for us. Um, our second one, but I think I liken this to that, um, you remember Death Magnetic when that came out? Yeah. By Metallica. I sure. bought that CD and I, I, like, I like Camaros. That's my car of choice. And I, was, I put that Death Magnetic CD in because I heard one of the guys in the band say this is more of a return to the roots. So I was like, yes, you know, I'm, I'm one of those, uh, the Metallica fan from the album one to four. Mm -hmm. And I put Death Magnetic in. 
a death magnetic. I turned it on. And I was like, you know, I, I played it two times in its entirety while driving. So that must have been a couple hour drive and probably speeding, blah, 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 and bang my head a bit. And I, I realized while I was listening, I was slightly criticizing, going, that's not as good as Master Puppets. I know where they got it from. That sounds like something off of Justice for All, but almost as good kind of thing. And then at the end of the, the two the two listens to the record, I, I remember pulling into my place, sitting in the driveway, ejecting the CD and going, Jesus, I would actually kill to have a CD where maybe it might not be like my Never Neverland album, but yeah. I just drove around the city. I drove around the city twice, banging my head a little bit and smiling for two effing hours. And if I could ever pull that off someday, I'd be the happiest guy in the world. Mission accomplished. So... Did Stu Block actually do scratch tracks? So. What's that? Say did, it again? Did Stu Block actually do the scratch tracks on the album or not? <laughs> no. I no, actually, there was. I, I talked. No, I, I talked to. I talked to Stu Block because um, he was on the seventy thousand tons of metal. That really awesome metal boat cruise that's been going for a decade, and I hosted a, like an all star jam on that thing for maybe six times, uh, six years, whatever. And Stu was on there. We did uh, Painkiller by Priest with, um, with Dave Lombardo from Slayer and uh, the bass player and Behemoth. And, yeah, it was just a, a riot. And um, I remember talking to him and said, listen, I know you just joined Ice Earth, I think it was, but if you ever want a job, uh, call me. <laughs> and, <laughs> so and was he, he never called. Ah, jeez. So, I know. No. Anyways. No, you he's, know, he's uh, I, yeah, go ahead. Well, I mean, it, it, he never called. I mean, that's what the, it would have been great. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, that would have been awesome. He's amazing, sir. 10 seconds about each lyrical theme about your albums, uh, about the new album. Sorry. No, I got it. You know what? I got to change it because I think about seven or eight of the songs are kind of about the same subject and they're just worded sometimes a little more specific and sometimes they're a little more general. Sure. And it's not like, it's not like the album is intentionally out there to try to create awareness for the subject and this and that. Now I'll make it real simple. Uh, in 2001, I wrote my, uh, I wrote a song about domestic abuse of violence and it mm -hmm. was kind on one of my records in 2001. And it was not about what people think. Uh, a lot of people think is the stereotypical domestic violence, which is a guy hits or hurts a girl. It was, the, it was in the reverse, and that happens a lot more than a lot of people think. And I wrote the song then, and it was kind of general, and you would assume it was a girl that was probably getting uh, the flack or the abuse, um, but it was actually written in the reverse. I since went on to write five more songs about that, that subject, and, uh, and uh, of course not condoning, more like sticking the middle finger in the air and just obviously saying how wrong it is. Now I'm not trying to preach anything. I'm just, it was just something I was writing about. A lot of times I'll write about something close to me or something on the news or just maybe something that has never happened or whatever. But this song, this album in general and the aggression in the music that I never used to really have all spawned from a personal incident. Um, a lot of it spawned from a personal incident that happened to me recently. And it wasn't actually me involved in the domestic, uh, abuse it was someone else but it was very close to me and i became a third party in that mess and try and i ended up trying to protect some people and help them out and just just felt like i was a protector but i had to get this record out personally nothing to do with fans or press or labels or nothing i had to get this whole thing out because um this was a long year out here having to deal with some pretty shitty stuff um, outside of my family's uh, place here. And I got through it, it like a therapy. I got through it by getting it all out in the music, writing this record. So basically the music, most of it is much angrier than anything I've ever done. And I was never really an angry dude anyway. Um, but this was therapy with all the songs and the music. And that's all stemming from my last year. I had to get that record out uh, physically by playing guitar and singing, but lyrically, it's either generally or specifically quite likely talking about the events that I've went through in the last, uh, or somebody I know I went through in the last little while. Um, so that's it. I mean, there's a couple of songs in there. One's called the attitude and it's just a pretty straightforward punk metal type of vibe. That's just putting the middle finger in the air, uh, not related to the subject I was hinting on there, but uh, that was more of um, anybody with a bad attitude, you know, just, yeah, that's just a generalized song. And I can't remember what the other one Out was. Out with like. the garbage? But I think we got a... 
Yeah, that'll be the same. That's all. It's all dom- domestic abuse, violence, or just nasty son of a bitches, or rever- reversed, and just uh, fiction and nonfiction. You know what I mean? It's just kind of a theme, and and you're probably not going to hear that again from me because I got that out of my system. But That's uh, good. That's yeah, good it was therapy. a very, in other words, a very per- personal personal record. It was total therapy, and uh, I'm glad I got it out. And and I'm also the only positive spinoff from the 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 SHIT that's happened in the last uh, year and a half. It's stopped now, but the only positive stuff that really came out of that was that a, it got stopped and, and B prevented from happening again, but also uh, it gave me probably one of the best records I've done in maybe two decades. All right. So how's this ballistic sadistic on January 24th on silver, silver lining music. Would you ever consider using like a stew block in the future? I I mean, look, you sound great vocally. The music sounds great, but I guess people want you to bring it to. Oh no, I know. You know what? I got interrupt. I got interrupt. You know, I saw your your uh, review, and mm-hmm. it was two. It was uh, wait. Let me guess. Wait, it wasn't Blaze Bailey. It was uh, the Iron Maiden. The other guy, Paul Diano, right? Yeah. Was it a live a live album by Paul Diano? You're, yes. you're talking about yeah. too, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I remember. I remember. I saw yours because a friend of mine said, "Dude, you got to check this out." Walmart. And then I think one of you guys might have sent it to me too, <laughs> uh, and it was awesome. No, it, it was awesome, and I remember uh, the dude in Walmart doing it was liking Just. the record, and you were liking it too. But you, were, but you were doing what a lot of people do, which is realizing that, hey man, if Waters had like a Stu Block or maybe a you know like Corey from Slipknot, or like I mean that's that's a little out of the head. No, metal I don't think about side, Corey. Yeah, yeah, the voice. No, no, but I mean, the thing about it, Corey could sing anything he wants, and he's a heavy metal fan. So like Dickinson, Halford, you know, all these classics. Um, even Hetfield, you know, like, it's just like, that's the one thing I'm not is my, I'm, I've never thought I was a good or great singer. I've only recently been able to, uh, been able to pat myself on the back for doing a two month tour and, um, finally got the singing and playing down after six records and a shit ton of tours. But that's that if I was kind of trying to commercially take this higher and make more money and all this kind of stuff, I would have made that move a long time ago and I would have, I would have essentially cut someone in and kept them as long as I could and, you know, put more focus on image and front man and, and selling records rather than just artistically hiring people and doing the, and me singing and all that kind of stuff. I'm kind of just doing this a hundred percent for the art and that sounds stupid, but, but you got to take care of the business to be able to, to comfortably sit and do your art. So you got to also make money and make it go. So it didn't make sense for me to hire a singer who was going to be out the door the next album anyway. You can't really keep people for very long if they're not an actual part of what you're doing. They have to be invested in it. And paying someone a salary, even if it's a great amount of money, it just doesn't work. I mean, you're either a part of it or you're hired. And a hired person is not always going to want to stay a hired person, right? Mm-hmm. Well, I get so, Yeah, it's, it's I, interesting. Well, so from your from your music from the musical standpoint from doing a record, um, that that would be something I would love to do outside of Annihilator. And I was considering if I cannot beat the record I just did as far as uh, it being a, a good record at this point in my career um, at 53 years old. Well, what I got my own studio. Um, I'm here in England, at 53, and I have my health so far. Why on earth would I not grab a Stu Block or Corey or someone and and do a project or start a new band? I mean, what the hell? If I if I do, I want to do five more albums and slowly go downhill with the quality of those, or do I want to sort of go out with something where I can say, hey, that was a good run? Yeah. What about Coben Farr? I mean, would you ever consider doing like a guest appearance vocal vocally by him? Oh yeah. Yeah, I, I talked to him last night. I talked. He was at my house in the summer, in August and September, uh, before we went out on our two month tour. And uh, I talked to him all the time. Basically, the clock's ticking. We have the summer, but especially the fall of the end of this year, where we really wanted. Like, I don't do this anniversary and reunion crap, uh, but this because just simply because I have a career that keeps marching on. So you you kind of in a, in a business sense, you don't want to start looking back all the time, but. Also, it's like, why? I, that was way back then 
this is now life's good. We're we're doing a lot of fun stuff over here for for three decades. But that's the one thing I would stop and go backwards for is is my favorite record and the one that the more people over here like than any other one. Um, and that was a reason why I, I talked to Coburn last year and said, "Dude, come on out to my place. Let's talk and see if we can do it." And you know, another thing too is a lot of people go, "Well, why don't you try and get the original band back and this and that?" And you know, it's you know, here's without naming any names, it's not usual or safe. It's even not even safe sometimes to get somebody back to put them through the travel and the busing, the planes, the airports, the crazy schedules, the diet, the the, the stress on stage, the, the nerves, the, the everything, the insecurities, whatever it is. 30 years or 25 years of never playing on a stage or ever touring is, it sounds easy to come back, but it ain't. This is actually something where I've been doing this for decades, but if you throw the average person that's right out of shape and just never played, you could give them a heart attack, and that's not even a joke. You you, you would oh, really yeah. have someone who's like physically going to have a health problem, a dehydration or a heart or whatever it is. And I realized when I, when I tried last year to sort of talk to the guys, some of the guys hadn't even picked up their instruments in decades. And then you see pictures and you realize, oh, you know, yeah. oh man, I don't want to be responsible for, for killing this guy. Um, <laughs> so I've been talking, talking. Well, you know, some bands could do it, but you also see what happens. I mean, it's it's quite a risk when you haven't done this for thirty years or twenty years, right? Um, yeah. You have to, train, you have to train, you have to get into shape if you've been out of it for this long. And and it's it's like there's a lot of heat, there's a lot of sweat, there's a lot of lights, there's a lot of lack of sleep, and your diet changes, your sleep changes. Um, and it's fun as hell, but if you're not used to it, man, you, you yeah. I, I see it all the time. I've had, I've had some friends from, you remember the Razor Amble Exciter, Voivod, Annihilator? Oh, yeah, I know all them all. The, I've, seen, I've, I've seen guys like, I'll, I'll say from the early days that I've talked to and are friends with from the, the bands that were before me, uh, who are now reuniting, or actually they've been playing shows maybe a couple times a year in Europe or a festival in South America, and then they go to do their first real tour that's supposed to go two weeks or three weeks in, in Europe, let's say, or, or South America. And you see that at least one guy is completely sick the entire trip because yeah. they're just not physically able to do it. And that's kind of why I would not be able to do a Neverland, Neverland uh, sort of reunion, but I would like to get Coburn on it. And that's yeah. it. It's been a while since you played the U.S. I mean, is there is it promoters? Is it is it just your choice not to go to the U.S.? No, it's, it's a combination of things. Some of it's me, some of it's many other reasons. Um, I, in, in a nutshell, it's a whole bunch of reasons. We, we left, technically left North America, now our own country, okay? So when, when the USA people are talking to me, they think I hate America or something. And, and by the way, America could mean Central or South or North America. But sure. anyway, um, it, it's like, you know... Why don't you play here? And you know, on the internet, everybody says, "Oh, he hates he hates the states and giving you shit." And and, and like, rightfully so, in one sense, to a metal fan, what kind of crap is that? That you're on the internet, uh, you know, advertising tours, and yeah, we got a new album, we're going on tour, and blah blah, and it's never in our home country, and never, especially never in the states. Essentially, in '93, we got dropped by Sony, and they at the time, if for those who weren't around at that time or or in the business at that time. Um, anything with the word heavy metal in their bio was asked to be dropped from the label unless it was selling over a certain amount of hundreds and hundreds of thousands. So you had uh, bands all of a sudden within the space of three months, you had Roadrunner and Sony turning around to me and dropping all these bands and saying, hey, Jeff, listen, we appreciate what you've done in the, last, the, the three albums here, but uh, we're kind of dropping this kind of music. It's not popular. And so unless you're willing to change the name of your band, change your image and play songs maybe in the style like Pantera, Sepultura, or Biohazard, uh, we're going to have to drop you, and we wish you luck. And that was a quote. What I just said, everything I rambled fast like that was because I've said it and heard it, and it's etched in my brain. That was the quote that was given to me by the A&R guy. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I kind of figured, okay, well, the A&R guy was God. Uh, he basically has politely said my career's over. Um, I guess I had a good run. Wow, I toured on the Painkiller Tour. I toured with Judas Priest, went Pantera. We did headline stuff. I went around the world, Japan, many, many times and made a bit of money. And okay, uh, I guess that's it. And I, I actually believed what I was told. Uh, four months later, I signed the, the 
most lucrative deal I'd ever signed in my life for the next four ye- or five years with uh, Music for Nations out of London in a Japanese label. Yeah. Um, and Annihilator was actually bigger than ever in Europe at the time for the fourth album called King to Kill. And I was actually singing and playing guitar then. Um, so everything was totally messed up and changed in a good way. But North America, forget it. That was the reason they were getting rid of most bands, unless you were turning into this newer style of metal, which, you know, bands like Sepultura, Biohazard, Pantera were, were blazing there. You had Rob Flynn changed his band and then turned around and, you know, he had red jumpsuits and he was playing a different yeah. kind of music with machine, machine Head and he tried this and he, that was the Roadrunner guy that changed, you know, the guys that changed. I didn't. I was like, hey man, I'm a heavy, heavy metal metalhead from the 80s. I ain't changing my stuff around and I'd rather just get a real job, I guess. And I didn't have to, but Seattle scene came in all this new style came in. There was nowhere to play. I remember Judas Priest would be playing and Slayer. They would be playing the big arenas and maybe even the small stadiums uh, in Vancouver area and stuff like that. And then fast forward 10 years, nine, eight years, you know, how about eight years after Painkiller album was out or Rust in Peace or, or these brilliant albums in 1990. Um, Priest is playing with Ripper Owens in the Vancouver 86th Street Music Hall Club. And then you saw Slayer play at the Commodore Ballroom in Vancouver on Granville Street, and that's a club. So you're you're seeing bands that only years earlier were playing the big arenas and headlining everywhere in the world, and now they're dropped down, lost their main singers. Iron Maiden went to Blaze Bailey. Uh, you saw Priest get Ripper, and they everything went down. And so the people near the bottom there were getting dropped and couldn't continue. And and the bands that Man, I tell you, there was a very small handful of mid-level metal bands in this kind of music, like Overkill, Exodus. Um, not, I'm not talk, talking about the bigger ones like Slayer, but yeah. Overkill, Exodus kept going. Um, Destruction Creator, Annihilator. We never stopped. We actually never stopped. And, and a lot of us get criticized, you know, Overkill, uh, Stephen Anthrax. Um, Testament, Testament, nonstop. But we always get criticized for lineup changes. And... The thing is that during that that later 90s and the early 2000s, man, I tell you, we were doing it because we loved it because we couldn't keep musicians. We couldn't afford to pay these people because the clubs were getting smaller and the record sales were getting less. There was no money to pay people to stay with your band. You know what I mean? And we needed good players like Testament Testament and Overkill and and Islander. We need good musicians, so we got to pay for it if we're hiring. Like Chuck and Eric, that's their band. Annihilator's my band. You've got you know, overkill Dee Dee Bobby, right? So you've got um, a whole slew of ex- Exodus members changing in. So um, I don't even know where I'm going with this, but... Um, <laughs> America, you know, why you're not playing America? Playing? Yeah, so, so then fast forwarding on, we never stopped overseas. So we were able to just keep going. I was literally buying cars, houses, building a recording studio, and nobody knew who we were in Canada or the States other than some band that put this album out called Alison Hale or had a song called Stonewall a decade ago, and I was having a, a fantastic career overseas. Um, and then I saw traditional heavy metal coming back. And the way I saw it coming back was some 41 would wear an Iron Maiden, or they do a, a solo with Iron Maiden harmonies in it on, on, yeah. a, on an MTV video or a much, much video. And then I'd see bands wearing Judas Priest, British Steel, or Motorhead shirts. Uh, and, I, and, and these were bands like Blink-182 style bands. And that's when it hit me. I went, you know what? These kids now, with this new thing called the internet, are they're going to be looking at these? These uh, they're going to be fifteen looking at these videos. They're going to go, who's Iron Maiden? Who's Motorhead? Who's Slayer? Who's British? Who's British Steel? <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? And um, they're going to look it up, and something's going to happen. And I wasn't the only one that thought this, but sure, what happened? The internet uh, showed all these young kids who these bands were, and they started freaking finding all these Slayer, finding all these bands that they had never heard of before. And that was actually, if you think about it, thanks to the pop punk bands and, and, and these sort of commercial bands that were out. Um, and that just kept rolling. And I thought, okay, give it a few years, and then fans are going to start discovering who's the next level. Okay, there's Slayer, there's Megadeth, there's Anthrax. Okay, well, who's next? Okay, Testament, Overkill, Exodus, Annihilator. You know, creator destruction, you know, uh, Sodom, all that stuff. So I kind of saw, hey, it's going to come back. Uh, it didn't come back in full force like it did in the 80s, but 
that's when I said, okay, now it's time to go back to the States and Canada and get a deal because nobody wanted to sign me. From 93 onwards, nobody would touch Annihilator. And I went out in 2007 and went back because the metal scene was really coming back. And I said, hey, I've got this um, record and I've got an offer from one of the big four to do uh, a, a pretty damn big month-long tour in North America. And that was a slot that was offered to me as a favor uh, and wipe out the buy-on fee because the buy-on fee was massive. You had to pay to get on the tour and they would say, listen, Waters, you, you haven't been here. We'd love to take you back. And all you have to do is get a record company in the States to sign you and get a release. And uh, my album was ready and not one company would, would sign me. And they simply said, dude, we appreciate, we appreciate what you're doing overseas, but here's the bottom line. We can't rip you off with a, with a crappy contract. You won't sign it. Number two, you're not a new band. Number three, you're considered an older band. Number four, you coming back to Canada and the States, you weren't big enough for it to be a big deal here. So that we don't want to invest in that either. And they're right. They're absolutely right with everything they just said. Like there's nothing wrong. And I, I sort of, in a way, arrogantly thought, eh, I'll just enjoy everything I'm doing overseas for 10 years. Maybe by that time, things will come back. And when they slowly started coming back, I figured it'd be a piece of cake to walk in. And that taught me a lesson. It taught me that just because the music goes out, and then it comes in, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get invited back in again. You didn't do the work for 10 years. You didn't slave away in a van doing the shitty club scene for 10 years. If you did, maybe you get some, uh, some you know, receptiveness from the industry there. But we didn't do it, so we're, we were paid the price. And that just blows my mind. I thought, hey, if you give them a free album and say I'm going on tour with that big band, um, that anybody would sign it, even for no money. And um, I was wrong. So... I was just shaking my head going, oh, well, I guess it's not meant to be. Um, hey, here's another thing. Uh, you know, if you look at Annihilator and you look at some of the comments and some of the sites, uh, especially in the States, of people who either think they know who we are or just discover us, one of the criticisms they got is the lyrics. And, and that's true. The kind of music that I had been doing and maybe I'm doing now it's not the kind of stuff that was really going on in the United States and therefore Canada sometimes. And, you know, in late nineties and two thousands aggression and this sort of more death metal style of vocals, thanks to guys like Phil Anselmo. I think he kind of is the one that really brought it to the masses, uh, that really screaming kind of vocals. Um, and rightly so, but, you know, I'm coming along singing songs about craft dinner and chicken and corn and then talking <laughs> about alcoholism and depression and, fucking things I see on CNN or uh, CBC or whatever and news and, and things happening, relationship stuff and, and some cheesy lyrics here um, half the time. Uh, and that just immediately turned off the uh, the new listener. What, what is this stuff? I thought a band called Annihilator was going to blow my mind and rip my head off. And, and now this is a song called Snake in the Grass, all about a chick that went bad. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. So, you know, that, that, stuff, that stuff was kind of more accepted by the Europeans. They sort of got the humor in some of the Canadianisms. and the, so Just like, you know, you got fucking Anvil writing about weed and hockey. You got Tragically Hit. Tragically Hit was writing about cultural Polar stuff, bears. Canadianisms. <laughs> That's right. Um, yeah, yeah. But do you seriously think that the Americans or the U.S. would want to hear about that? I mean, maybe weed, but not, not about hockey games and, uh, you know, and, and Annihilator. They don't. They're, they're sitting here trying to scream to Phil Anselmo and Cannibal Corpse and real heavy stuff and, and Slayer and, you know, God Hates Us All. And then here's Waters. Uh, remember, there's 10 songs on a record sometimes, but there might be six that they might like, but they're only going to be hearing the one or two that really in their mind suck or they're going to or somebody's going to pick up on. So it was a whole combination. So bottom line is we probably weren't playing or writing the music that made any sense for, for U.S. metal fans to sort of get into. And of course, Canada, forget it. I mean, I've, I've seen as if we were ever going to have a chance or anyone really had a chance there in the last 20, 30 years, because you saw in Canada, um, it was like, you just, you know, metal with, you had Devin Townsend and Danko Jones, two of the most awesome music. And then for wackiness and craziness and originality, you got Voivod. So, you got, and then look, I'll throw myself, I'll throw myself in there arrogantly. I don't care. You got Waters, who's actually probably selling, I won't say how much more or whatever records, but we're selling X amount of records somewhere else consistently for 30 years. And then 
you've got Danko Jones, who we would tour with sometimes over in Europe and follow him around on tour. He'd follow us, the same venues. And we'd be all pissed off because Danko Jones would be doubling our ticket sales at this city or that city. And occasionally we get close and sometimes smoke them, but we're good friends, right? Yeah, so it was a fun competition. Sure. Then you've got probably the most genius dude in electric guitar, heavy music or keyboardish, heavier, dark, whatever you want to call it, music, Devin Townsend. And okay, get this. I'm in Ottawa. I was in Ottawa watching an acoustic performance by this genius about 10 years ago to about 60 people. Crazy. And then Danko Jones, Danko Jones would play Barrymore's uh, on Bank Street in Ottawa, a club that would hold 800. And Danko Jones would play, be half full. And the, the, the lady that owned the venue uh, had a, a leaky venue that was pouring water onto the monitor board, which would have, could have killed the band. And Danko was, and the guys were having to get, uh, to beg them for towels and water for the show. And I'm shaking my head going out to the store yeah. to get them stuff and buy them breakfast the next morning. Because now this is how some of these musicians have been treated for being geniuses in the worldwide music business, this is how they've been treated in Canada. So on the one hand, Canadian, Canada is the best com uh, country in the world and has spawned the most original musicians out there. On the other hand, don't tell me they support their musicians. They'll only support them if they are like Canadian managers that sign the band, then they'll go through the old system of must go through universal, must go through this, must go through that way necessarily. You've got this local mentality of yet, certain Canadian bands that were even sort of popular in Canadian clubs back in the late 80s, early 90s, you, you get more press for a band like that than you would from a Canadian band that's been out there slogging away, waving the Canadian flag internationally. Yep. And the only way, the only way that you could get that recognition, if Annihilate, the only way Annihilator or Devon or Danko or, or, or Anvil could have got that is if they had signed to a Canadian company. I forget Amble because they were with Attic Records, Al Mayer, way back in the in the day. That was a different situation. But the only way Danko, Devin, Jeff could get their bands going in Canada, really going, like really recognized and, and promoter or just to help or acknowledge at least. Yeah, they've been awarded Juno. So that's not what I'm talking about. Um, is if they had signed to a manager and the manager brought them to that label and the label brought them to that publisher and we fell into the system that they could claim, yes, this is our band, we signed them. And I'll give you a good example. The, th this may not be completely true, but this is how I remember it. So it might actually be not 100% accurate. When we were nominated for a Juno a few years back, we lost, uh, and that was, that was a given. We were told by this guy at CBC that, oh, you're not going to win. Uh, you were just nominated because too many of the people voting were, were pissed off that your band had never got acknowledged here. So they they had to at least put you in the category this year. And I'm like, really? That's what it was? So we never had a chance, but and we didn't care. That was not what it was about. But what happened was I think a band that had had like almost no Facebook likes or social media, this or that, and I think they had a, maybe an EP or a demo out, they won. Oh, yeah, I and know the system is. We were thinking... Yeah, we, we were thinking, like, wait a second, I know this, I know everything's fixed here, and somebody was even saying, from a CBC guy was even saying to me, dude, it's more fixed in the U.S. here uh, than those awards down there. And I was like, okay, well, what's the deal? How did a band with, with no social media, no previous sales, no nothing, they don't have anything? And the, guy, the CBC guy goes, well, yeah, but that's what happens when the manager who's tied into that label signs them, they... They try to see if they can promote and make the band kind of famous before they even play a note or you even hear them. <laughs> and, and I'm like, I'm just thinking, dude, like, and you know what? That was, it was funny because we were just going down to play a show, an Annihilator show for 48,000 people in Santiago, Chile. Okay. Wow, yeah. So here I am, here I am telling the guys, I'll meet you down there and I'm going to go to the Junos for fun. And get all dressed up and I'm going down to play 48,000 people on my, I don't know, 14th record, 15th record, three, 4 million records sold from Canada. Like I'm from this country, from this country and we were nominated. So I said, I'm going, I know I'm not going to win this, but I want to go and dress up and eat the steak and I want to have fun and see what it's like at these things. Cause I caught it already was laughing at the Canadian business for decades anyway. 
But I went, and you know, there's always that one percent that what if we won? You know what I mean? Um, and then, then I get there, and the, the CBC guy was telling me all about how it works, and I was I was stunned that they would they they pick it based on who either who is successful outside of the country, and they have no choice but to turn around and acknowledge them, or they pick it based on. What, who, whose system are they with? Which manager, publisher, label, agency are they with? And I'm like, that's not an award show. That's a fix. It was great chatting with you, buddy. Uh, <laughs> Ballistic Sadistic, January 24th uh, on Silver Lining Music. I love it. Go out and buy it. It's a great album, and it's a return to thrash. Thank you so much, Jeff, for being on the show. Yeah, if you're Jimmy. Jimmy, I might consider getting another stinger someday if you over-promote this record. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, thanks much. Bye-bye. Bye.